all its fatigues, its dangers, and its honors. Believe me, there is no man on earth with whom I should feel equal pleasure in sharing them as with yourself. William Clark wrote back, This is an undertaking freighted with many difficulties. But my friend, I do assure you that no man lives with whom I prefer to undertake such a trip. Lewis and Clark enlisted soldiers, boatmen, guides, and interpreters to accomplish the journey. Just before leaving on the expedition, Sergeant John Ordway wrote to his parents. Honored parents, I am now on an expedition to the westward with Captain Lewis and Captain Clark, who are appointed by the President of the United States to go through the interior parts of North America. We are to ascend the Missouri River with a boat as far as it is navigable and then go by land to the Western Ocean, if nothing prevents. We expect to be gone 18 months or two years. I am to receive $15 per month and at least 400 acres of first-rate land. The expedition was known as the Corps of Discovery. They left their camp at Wood River, just north of St. Louis, Missouri, and sailed a keelboat and two small pirogues up the Missouri River to find its headwater. The Corps brought along many guns to protect themselves from Indian tribes that might be hostile and for hunting animals. When the expedition left on May 14, 1804, their supplies included 176 pounds of gunpowder sealed in 52 lead canisters. The canisters were the invention of Meriwether Lewis. When corked and sealed, the powder inside stayed secure and dry. Lead has a low melting temperature. Heated up in a cauldron, it liquefies and can be poured into bullet molds. In seconds, the lead hardens into a bullet and usually pops right out. You don't pick it up yet because it's still pretty hot. Once cooled, the bullet must be trimmed and smoothed before it can be fired from a rifle or musket. This hard piece of lead from molded shot, called a sprue, is snipped off and thrown back into the melting pot. The shot is then worn smooth by rolling them together in a heavy buckskin pouch. The expedition brought different molds for the different caliber weapons they carried. In addition, Captain Lewis noted 420 pounds of sheet lead on the supply list at the start of the expedition, all for making bullets. The Corps of Discovery was self-sufficient and prepared to live off the land and defend themselves as they made their way west. They traveled as far up the river as they could before winter set in. They built a fort and camped near the Mandan Indians. They spent an extremely cold winter there in what is now North Dakota. While they were with the Mandan Indians, they learned a new way to tan hides for their clothing. The Lewis and Clark expedition spent a lot of time preparing animal skins and turning hides into leather for making shirts, trousers, and moccasins. The first priority was to remove the skin from the animal as soon as possible after it had been killed. Once the skin was off, the flesh and hair had to be removed. The best way to do that was to stretch the hide and use a sharp scraping tool to get the skin as clean and thin as possible. This way the hide would tan better and be more supple or soft. Scraping usually took the most time in the tanning process and you had to be careful not to cut through the hide. When the skin turned white or light brown, the scraping was done. At this point in the tanning process, you had a rawhide which had uses all its own, 
like making knife sheaths or containers called par flushes. But to make clothing, you had to continue tanning. The hide was taken off the frame and soaked in water from one to seven days, depending on the size of the hide. The soaking turned the hide back into skin and made it more receptive to the tanning solution. Then came tanning, which refers to making the skin permanently soft. Many of the explorers knew how to tan using tannic acid from the hardwood trees of the east. Since there were no hardwood trees on the plains, the explorers probably learned brain tanning from the Mandan Indians. This method involved removing the animal's brain, smashing it up and boiling it in water to make a paste. After the boiling, the mushy solution was allowed to cool before smearing it on the hide. Then the hide was folded or rolled with the brain solution on it and left to sit overnight. The rule of thumb was that each animal had enough brains to tan its own hide. By the next day, the brains would be completely soaked into the skin. Then came the most laborious part, stretching the hide until it became completely dry. This had to be done by hand. If they stopped before it was absolutely dry, it would stiffen up and have to be re-tanned. Finally, the hide was smoked over a very smoky but not hot fire. This was an all-day job and was done until the entire skin had a nice brownish color. The smoking permanently preserved the skin so it could get wet and not stiffen up. Then you had a completely brain-tanned elk hide, ready to be made into clothing. While at Fort Mandan, Lewis and Clark hired an interpreter named Charbonneau and his Indian wife, Sacagawea, to accompany the Corps to the Pacific Ocean. The next spring, they set out to find the headwater, or beginning, of the Missouri River. Having found it, they then had to find their way across the Rocky Mountains. Sacagawea led the explorers to the Shoshone Indians, whose leader was her brother. The Shoshone provided horses to the expedition. The horses helped them get through the Rocky Mountains and then to the Clearwater River, which is one of the rivers that would lead them to the Pacific Ocean. Clark and a few hunters had gone ahead to hunt food for the expedition. They encountered a few Nez Perce Indians gathering plant roots. The Indians tried to run away, but Clark was able to catch them and soon make friends with them. The Nez Perce gave the hungry explorers salmon to eat, but it was too rich for them. The rest of the journey to the ocean, they rejected fish and ate meat, like horse, elk, and dog. Lewis liked the dog meat, but Clark never acquired a taste for it. The Lewis and Clark expedition used dugout canoes to travel from the Clearwater River, down the Columbia River, and to the Pacific Ocean. They learned to build these canoes from the friendly Nez Perce Indians. The dugout method was a labor-saving way to make a canoe. The tools that were needed were simple. Axes, adds, broad axes and saws, all of which the explorers had with them. Once the tree was felled, the log was squared and the ends trimmed. Then the log was turned over and the bottoms were smoothed and rounded with adds and axes. The log was then turned upright, and the actual method of building the dugout canoes began. Using a saw and axe, the top was notched out and cut away. Then fires were set to carefully burn out the inside. After the burning was done in one area of the log, the ads were used to chip out the charred wood. This burning and chipping was the most important part of making dugout canoes. The idea was to make it easier for the exhausted expedition members as charred wood chips out with less effort than unburned green wood. So that the fires didn't burn too deeply and get out of control, buckets of water were kept nearby. 
This process was repeated until the dugout was finished. The explorers were able to work in shifts to build the canoes. They made five canoes in 10 days. And in them, they paddled down the Clearwater, Snake, and Columbia Rivers to the Pacific Ocean. On November 7, 1805, the Corps first heard the crashing of ocean waves. Captain Clark wrote, Ocean in view! Oh, the joy! Because of bad weather, the Corps of Discovery did not actually reach the mouth of the Columbia River until November 15th. There they searched for the highest ground and set up a camp. The Indians told them that hunting was better on the south side of the river. There they built a fort and named it after the friendly Clatsop Indians. Fort Clatsop was begun on December 7, 1805 and finished on January 1, 1806. It was square-shaped with 50-foot long walls. In the middle was a 20-foot wide parade ground. The fort had seven rooms in all. The captains were in one room and the Charbonneau family was in another. The remaining people were crowded into three other rooms. And the last two rooms held meat and supplies. While half of the men built the fort, the other half formed hunting parties. Armed with flintlock rifles and muskets, the men found an abundance of game nearby. There was a Fort Clatsop record on December 13, 1805, when the explorers shot 18 elk in one day. As the winter wore on, however, the explorers were forced to go farther and farther to find elk. By March, the elk were beginning to migrate to the mountains and hunting became more difficult. Stalking the game through marshes and bogs in constant storms or rain and wind made the hunters miserable. The elk provided the explorers with food, hides for clothing and blankets. Also the fat or tallow was used for candles. Antlers were made into buttons. The animal brains were used for tanning hide into leather. Nothing was wasted. To preserve extra meat, it was smoked into jerky and stored in a meat room in the fort. At times it was difficult but the captains tried to maintain a three-day supply of meat at Fort Clatsop. The Lewis and Clark expedition spent a lot of time preparing animal skins and turning them into leather for making shirts, trousers, and moccasins. It took a great deal of time to make the clothing for their return trip. In addition to clothing, the explorers made about 10 pairs of moccasins per person. They had three different hides to work with. Deerskin was the thinnest and was mainly used for shirts. Elk was a thicker skin that could be used for shirts, pants, and sometimes moccasins. The thickest skin was buffalo. It was perfect for moccasins. But the moccasins wore out quickly, lasting only one or two weeks. That's why the explorers made so many pairs for the trip back. Tallowing was an important part of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Rendered from animal fat, tallow could be used for making candles, as a lubricant for firearms, as a salve for cracked, chapped skin, and in emergencies, they could even eat it. As the pot boiled, the fat was rendered into an amber liquid. The water evaporated, leaving the purified fat or tallow and bits of fried meat and tissue, or cracklings. The cracklings floated to the top, were removed, and then the tallow was poured off. When cooled, the tallow hardened into an off-white, waxy substance. At Fort Clatsop, it took a lot of work to produce a little bit of light inside the fort. 
All the quarters had fireplaces to throw light as well as heat. The captain's quarters had the largest fireplace because Lewis and Clark needed the most light to work on their maps and journals. Meriwether Lewis was a far-sighted planner. Included in his supply list of 1803 were candle molds and wicking. To wick a tin candle mold, each length of cotton string was dropped into a tube. The ends were knotted at the bottom of the mold and tied to a stick at the top. They made sure the wicks were centered in the mold. Then they heated up the tallow. As it heated, it turned back into the amber-colored liquid that it was during rendering. When the tallow was syrupy, it was ready to be poured into the molds. If it was too hot, it became watery and leaked out the bottom. Dipping the mold in water would stop the leak. Then the mold was left to set for a while and cool. After cooling, the knots were cut and the excess tallow broken off. The candles would burn up to a few hours, depending on what kind of fat the tallow was made from. Sometimes the candles smoked and sputtered. The explorers mixed beeswax into the tallow to make the candles burn better. The candles were a great help to Lewis and Clark as they compiled their maps and journals of discovery during the dark rainy winter at Fort Clatsop. Every explorer carried a fire starting kit, a steel 